What's up, former party people? This is Jerry, you know, the one who actually combs his hair on the A is for Alcoholic podcast. Now, if you're finding value in listening to the AIFA podcast every week and you want to support sharing it with others, we invite you to become a sustaining monthly or per show contributor. Go to patreon.com backslash AIFA. It's super easy and it only takes a quick moment. It's about as easy as buying one of those pre-cooked space chickens from the grocery store, taking it outside, giving it a big old kiss, and kicking it into traffic. (laughs) Why would you do that? Anyway, you do you, and I'll do me. Again, go to patreon.com backslash AIFA. And with that, people, let's start the show. A is for Alcoholic is a program about recovery. My name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. And my name is Jerry, and I'm an alcoholic. Join us as we go through the alphabet of alcoholism one letter at a time. Welcome Yo. back to a, the, the, the final episode of this round. I guess you call it a season, but I mean, it seems, I mean, it, what, it, what is it? It's just another round to the a alphabet. Season. It's a I, season. I call it a season. Yeah. It's a season. Look, welcome back to Cat Dandy here. We're... <laughs> John and I discuss all things involving cats and our love for cats. Let me tell you. Um, what there the was some report. <laughs> there was some protest report, and there were, the news reporter saw some guy, and it's like, and he's got a cinder block, and it wasn't a cinder block. It was like one of those little cat houses that's like covered <laughs> in carpet. It's like settle yeah. down here. <clears throat> um, but but yeah. also, it's irresponsible to take your cat to a protest. <laughs> well, it depends. To a, ri- a riot or uprising. An uprising. You can take your cat to the protest, but if shit starts getting hot, you get that you get that pussy out of there, dude. Right? You got to take care yeah. of it. Do you think that's like it- irresponsible cat ownership? It is. <laughs> I, I um. So it's our final episode of the fourth season, and originally my thought was to do a Zoom meeting and just allow people to pop in and out, but. I'm not uh, savvy enough as a Zoom moderator to handle mm-hmm. that business. And I just felt like it would get out of control or I wouldn't <laughs> well, be able yeah. to, I wouldn't be able to, you know, it's hard enough to follow my own line of thinking and dialogue. Yeah. Do you know what right. I mean? Without any sort of structure and so. Well, yeah, exactly. And I, I didn't know what, what path the conversation would take. I was like working out. I was doing my stretches, getting ready to work out. And in my mind just kept repeating some just dude just blasting in the Zoom meeting and showing everybody's balls and yelling Baba Booey or something and it's rolling <laughs> out. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I mean, not that, not, not that a ton of people know us, but you know, no. I don't know, man. Yeah, I yeah. hear you. So... This may be something that we do in the future if I can, you know, we'll see how it goes. And I just didn't want it to be, I didn't want the show to be contingent upon the, the Zoom meeting itself. I'm right, not saying we right. can or have if them, like, we just don't need to record it. Right. Or if, like, no one showed up, I guess it would just be me and you, like, the two saddest kids <laughs> at the birthday party. It's just like, right? I, it was my birthday, I invited everybody, and only you showed up, which is great. I'm so happy you're there, but, but also I'm like, fuck, is this us two? You want to watch fucking Monster Squad or what? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, when you hand out all the little handmade invitations to your birthday party at recess, and then the bell rings, and they all throw them on the ground, and you're just left there yeah, on the dude. basketball court, and all the invitations floating around in the wind. Yo, did you? Did that happen to you too? Did you just <laughs> peek into my life? Cause that shit happened. I there was there was one. I had one birthday, and so it must have been ten or eleven. It was fifth or sixth grade, and I remember giving out a bunch of invitations, and like nobody showed up. Yo. Like like it was like my dad and my brother and my dad's girlfriend and like her little boy, and I just yeah. remember feeling like. How come nobody showed up? You know, and that first kind of like that first hit of feeling so unimportant or, you know, right. What would later. I, be- yo, dude, that little alcoholic had to be incubated somehow. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that little alcoholic needed an mm-hmm. origin story. I mean, I'm over exaggerating <laughs> about the invitations I, on the on the on the playground, but. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely had one of those those moments um, as a little kid. I definitely had mm-hmm. one of those birthdays. Did you too? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, nobody wanted to play with me in general. I have those moments. Valentine's Day, fifth grade, we'd make a little cardboard 
cardboard uh, mailboxes and tape them to the front of your desk, mm-hmm. and then all the kids would get up, and we'd have a cake or whatever, and they'd put candies. And I got a couple of Valentines, but I remember one boy coming over and just opening up the little fucking paper mailbox I would made and just hawking a loogie in it, and then <laughs> just like smashing it shut, like with his hands just smashing the, <clears throat> all the loogie and into all the candy and shit that was in there and then just walking away and this dude was like could have fucking fucked me up so i was just like just crying you know shit like that but you know birthday parties are weird i wasn't allowed to eat sugar as a kid so nobody wanted to come Mm. to my birthday parties because my mom's like you're allergic so it would be like well everybody else would get like candy bags and i'd just be sitting there with like a like a bag of jacks like just playing (laughs) jacks i guess i don't know Eh, little little right. little did she know how allergic you would become to certain <laughs> distilled Dude, sugars. Lit off of that motherfucker. Yeah, exactly. I was like, "Well, my- <clears throat> um but yeah, it's it's a uh yeah, so we just didn't want to have that kind of party and have the uh, show contingent upon that. Like I said, I feel like I feel like it might be a good idea if to to I might put uh, just do a Zoom meeting and invite people and and I I certainly also don't want it to be representative of any particular program but i feel like inviting strangers into a room without any structure just leaves it open to anything right i mean there was that um there was that zoom meeting with the like the la city council and the and the chief commissioner did you see that clip yeah you told the guys like dick yeah that shit (laughs) i was dying that was so funny so i mean He's like, I reclaim my time, or what? I I relinquish my time, and then he had three more seconds. <laughs> He's like, "Fuck you!" Yeah, back. yeah. I thought it was he great. Suck my dick and yeah. choke it. So, um, but that being said, this is A is for alcoholic program about recovery, sobriety, uh, trying to figure it all out, mm-hmm. and um, and however you you do that. I did want to read to you, and I have some questions about this this message I got from one of our patrons right and it's from rob and he says back in the 90s i was a barista at a grimy little joint called bade manners in sydney uh and when customers were out of line or being wankers we'd kick them the fuck out customer service has gone too far these days in a fake happy you're you're amazing kind of way Mm -hmm. i I would agree with that 100 percent uh hey jerry company flow question mark def jux question mark run the jewels okay thumbs up pow Keep talking the talk, love the flow of all topics, booze, geopolitics, whatever it all comes out genuinely, and you always check yourselves on what you say, not just spewing opinions. Plenty of laughs, too. Stay safe over there. So insane and needed crisis, I think. Zoom sounds good. Can I vape? (laughs) Rob. (laughs) So, Uh I mean, yeah, I think when we do have a Zoom, I mean, I suppose you could vape. I would have, yeah, I'd... You know, the only reason whatever. I don't vape on it now is because we did that first episode and I was vaping and some dude was like, sounds like somebody's smoking a joint the whole time. And I was like, well, yeah. And you know what? I listen to other podcasts too and nobody's vaping on those podcasts. So I'm like, mm, yeah, not going to, I don't know. It doesn't, it's like when somebody, I was, I had a Zoom call with somebody and they were like sitting down to dinner while we were talking uh-huh. and I'm like. Well, you're just fucking just, just munching away. Like, I'm trying to, we're trying to have a conversation. It was Danny. And it was I get Danny it. Clay, and he's sitting there eating a quesadilla. Uh, just like, <laughs> come on, man. Like, it wasn't, but it was just like, yeah, like, come on. You know, we got to be, we're talking, and, you know, especially people are listening. And so I think that that brings us to our topic today. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to go Z is for zip it. And that basically just that we need to listen to other people. And it's really, I I should say, we don't need to do shit. You don't need to do shit. I, you know, um, it is, it has been infinitely, um, uh, important to my sobriety and my recovery to listen to other people, to shut my mouth Yeah. because it was always my inclination to be loud and to be boisterous and to, scream at the top of my lungs or say something that I thought was funny or shocking or whatever. Yeah. I was digging up a lot of these old videos, these, the, these home movies that you and I made. Yeah. Oh God. And I, I just put them unlisted on YouTube cause I didn't really feel like having them out there. And, uh, and I'm just looking back and I'm thinking not only was I like a bigger dude, but I was so just all about like, what could I say that could be 
found offensive. Or oh shocking yeah, or... that's what drew me to you, man. You know what I was gonna <coughs> say uh, with those videos? Maybe <coughs> you should make that a Patreon, like, <laughs> like yo, if you, d- Level if you up. donate like <laughs> Do five you bucks, see- you can watch a video of me and John mm-hmm. wrestling in a bed. If you, we if you donate fat this. Drunks. <laughs> If there's any interest out there, if you haven't already gone to our Patreon, and I know that we put a little bumper at the top of it, um, you know, you basically, what is Patreon? It's a way for you to promote or to to support the show. Um, it pays for things like the editing software that I use. That's I'm on a monthly and or whatever yearly lease or whatever. Um, it helps us with the, you know, the podcast hosting site. Um, it even pays bills and pays rent sometimes you know so if that's something that you're interested in if you if you like the show if it feels good to you if you have a dollar to put in that's great if not the show's that's always cool. free yeah we also jerry and i do i don't we don't have any up yet we've released them all but we'll we'll do uh movie reviews for for movies on or about alcoholism or sobriety or recovery um and you know anything else that we have that that we have thoughts on you know that are not necessarily pertaining directly to a letter of the alphabet so right. it's something to think about and if any of you patrons out there want to see some old like 17 year old movies that Jerry and I made <laughs> some of them are a little triggering though like i pour myself the <clears throat> stiffest drink in one of those movies i know and I know. And Megan's like, do you ever stop pouring? And I'm like, you were married to me. You know I don't stop pouring, you know, because I'm just like pouring the drink into the glass and it just is like, it's uh-huh. all cheap whiskey and then like a quarter inch of like ginger ale. I don't know. I know, man. And I just, how how bloated we were, we both were. Yeah. It was amazing yeah. to me. Um, Like, like what the fuck? alcohol bloat. Yeah, it was a trip, man. It was a trip to watch those, yeah. Oh, and you know what? I know this was about 10 minutes ago, but uh, uh, Rob Powers' email, he was referring mm-hmm. to uh, Company Flow is a hip-hop group from New York. And okay. LP, who is one of the members of Run the Jewels mm-hmm. now, he was in Company Flow. And then Def, Def Jux is a label that's put out a bunch of cool-ass people. Um, but yeah, I fucks with all that. I don't listen to okay. as much Company Flow as I used to, though. I've just like basically listened to Run the Jewels and like some more i don't know a lot of the hip-hop i listen to nowadays is more like singer songwriter kind of hip-hop like anderson pock and uh yeah mm-hmm. i love anderson pock i love kendrick you know you and i trade stuff you know the yeah deal. yeah we can even huh? do just i like both those guys yeah but that new run the jewels is yeah. fucking dope to run to like literally run i listened to some of it yeah well and i i remember when it came at the end of uh, and i don't want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't watched all of ozark Mm-hmm. yet but uh when it comes on at the very end of the last season of ozark oh there's a run- la la oh yeah uh, yeah oh, you a, haven't watched i don't watch you, ozark did you watch the whole thing ozark no yeah. megan likes that show i don't really i started it one night when i had insomnia and i don't remember it was like a fever dream <laughs> i watch old episodes the of the is... twilight zone dude i like fuck with that really hard right now yeah um <clears throat> but the importance of listening. Yeah, let's do that. And and it's and it's <laughs> and it's 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 place in my recovery was I remember first coming in to to recovery and being sober for a few months on my own. And it was really hard. I was I very much had a very thick skull about everything and I I did it begrudgingly. And I always did it for, at first I did it for somebody else. It was never about me. It was never about, oh, I'm going to fix my life. It was like, well, so-and-so said I should, so I guess I will. And I'm still trying to think back to the very first, you know, the first meeting I went to after I got sober. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't remember why I went back. I mean, I must have gotten something from that first meeting. There must have been some relief, but I don't recall. I mean, everything was so hazy then. It's so... yeah. I almost feel like those first four or five months, there was this constant cloud of, it was almost like this extended hangover. Yeah. In a way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, but 
I, I certainly wasn't going to share because sharing is scary and talking in front of people is scary and, and talking in front of large groups of people and being open and honest is fucking frightening. So I think one of the good things about the meetings for me was by default, I would just sit there. And it became this sort of anchor for each week because I was only going to one a week and I wasn't doing any work. I wasn't talking. I wasn't sharing. And so I was by by default, I would have to listen to and it was a speaker discussion meeting. So and that was the thing that and we've talked about this before. The speaker discussion meetings tend to have a little more blood and guts, a little more that the dark side. Yeah. Which I think people in early sobriety are still thinking about that life and thinking about that that way of thinking and that way of being and so there's something more attractive to it or at least it resembles more of your own life so therefore I I felt like I could listen more and yeah. trust more uh-huh yeah and I I felt like that was that was a really important thing with the stories as far as listening but I I and I couldn't have done it on my own there's no I don't believe there was any way I could I mean I did for like two months, but it was awful. It was the worst way that I could have done it. And, um, you know, I think we've talked about this maybe once before, about how you have to use somebody else's brain. You have to use somebody else's thoughts to kind of change your own. You don't, yeah. you don't sit in a vacuum. Yeah. So yeah. do you, do you remember like going to the rooms or if there was a period or a point where you were like, wow, I really need to learn this stuff or, yeah, something was an epiphany about this could really help. I do, I do. It's so funny because I really relate when you said the first four months were just a haze. Like it's hard mm -hmm. for me to remember really specific things, but there's one moment, and I think it was like my second or third meeting, like AA meeting, because I had gone to like I've said this before, but my first two meetings were NA meetings because I didn't know where to find the AA meetings because I was you know. Mm -hmm. I was drunk, like I was <laughs> coming out of active <laughs> alcoholism. I didn't know what the where the fuck to go find an AA meeting. Um, so when I, I remember it was like, yeah, my second or third day. And the reason why it stands out is because it was a stag meeting. It was all men in the basement of this, of course, church. And they said, well, if this is like your first meeting, it might have been my first meeting actually, because they're like, if this is your first meeting, you know, come on up and get a book or whatever. So I walked up and I got a book. And then I sat down and I've told you the story. And then the guy in front of me turned around and went, Hey, everything you need to know is on, is the first three words on page, whatever. And so he says like everything you need to know. And I thought he was being sarcastic, like a smart ass. And then I, he turned back around and I opened it up and it was like page, whatever. And I looked at in the first three words, you know, the story, right? It says, read this book, you know, he's like everything. <laughs> and that was like the first, you know, and I was like, God damn, this is like something out of a fucking movie. Like I, this, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm in like a recovery movie, and to me, I was so dramatic and everything in the beginning that I was just like, "Yeah, this is it. Like this is it. Like this motherfucker looks like some dude I would never talk to, some goofy fucking dude." Turned around, said the coldest shit in the world to me, and turned back around again, and just went on listening, you know. And so that really stuck with me. And all I ever do is listen. I rarely share because I lose track of what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. I get embarrassed or get self-conscious. I become really aware. It's hard for me to be really sincere sometimes because I get emotional sometimes when I share in a big room too. So my voice starts cracking and shit because I'm so overcome with like whatever's going on in the room. You know, even if it's a positive thing, I'm just so grateful to be there and around other alcoholics that like it's hard for me to open up my mouth because I feel like I might start fucking crying sometimes. And I just don't, I'm not really comfortable doing that in a big room full of people. We've done podcasts where I've teared up and I've known you for years and I still feel uncomfortable doing that. I'm like, yo, this is my secret shit. Like I don't need to be busting out my secret shit, even though I probably should be more in tune with that, you know? So for me, sharing is difficult anyway, but listening, I've always been really good. When I put my mind to it, I've always been a very good listener. And I always try to get something out of all of it, you know. <coughs> I try to. <coughs> Excuse me. But yeah. Um, it's, it's also, I think also listening to other people, there's just new ideas, that new ways of thinking that I, that never occurred to me. And yeah. there's plenty of, there's plenty of, pithy platitudes yeah. and um, slogans and, and things like that. But 
I think these things are important. These are these are kind of um, they're like little memes, right? Yeah, they are. They're, they're pretty they're these little are, things yeah. that we say, <laughs> right? And so it's helpful for me when I'm in a stressful situation. Oh, only one one day at a time, you know. God mm-hmm. grant me the serenity. Um, easy does it. Um, you know, whatever it is. And so I think these are important things to, they're important for me to take on and to make a part of myself so that I can have something that reminds me that there is a better way of living, that there's, that there's a, an easier way to think about the world, Yeah, you know? And, and I, when you talk about the guy you're like i would never go i would never talk to this guy i would never hang out with this guy right and it really it reminds me too of of what's going on in the world right now right and the idea that there's we are so uncomfortable around people who don't look like us right now whether that's in a recovery room or in a different community or whatever and the only way that I know in recovery that I've been able to grow is by setting aside my judgments entirely, you know, yes. and just listening to another human being and going. And, and it's it's only through that level of the only the only thing I ever had to lose was my shitty way of thinking. Mm-hmm. The only thing I ever had to lose was my was this terrible life I was leading you know, and, and abusing myself and, uh, at the expense of, of myself and others. And so I just think about like listening to other people and listening to, to the things that are going on right now. And one of the other things that comes up in, 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 in the world right now that I, that I think about that correlates to me with, recovery and sobriety one of these platitudes that i've heard is get comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah yeah they say this all the time Mm -hmm. okay so life sucks or you're miserable or you can't stop drinking and you want to you want to learn another way you want to feel better about yourself you want to get more organized you want to get healthier you want to get more whatever spiritually fit like you're it's going to be uncomfortable and it's not going to feel good because you're breaking down your your whole ego like yeah the fucking your whole self your whole self identity as a drunk as an alcoholic i mean how many times you've been have you beaten your chest some night and like i'm an alcoholic this is the way that i am you can't change me can't change me and how megan and (laughs) right and so i just i feel like it really correlates a lot to what's happening out there in the world in the streets now it absolutely right now, does you know? and i didn't think about it that way <laughs> and now that you bring it up it's like there's a lot of, it just is a lot of clarity yes so um i haven't written my 12 steps to uh you know solve your racism yet but right <laughs> exactly know what i mean but it's or like, like you know yeah to reconcile <laughs> with my privilege and how am i yeah exactly. right but this this is this is a real thing and so yes it's uncomfortable and yes you're like oh my god mm-hmm. have i been complicit in my own shitty life yeah or have i been complicit in other the way i've treated other people unconsciously yeah you know so here's a program of recovery maybe you know it's time to listen to these other people who have other ideas about how li- there's what there's how many billions is there 7 billion eight, people on I the planet is it eight 9 now? 8 yeah we're at a i mean how many load. different how many different ways is there to live life and to look at the world yeah. there's 8 billion mm-hmm. so like what makes you you know or what makes me so sure that mine is the right way right now i'm not saying that I mean, I need to have some semblance of reality and faith and trust to go about my daily life, right? Correct. Like, I can't just go, I'm unsure of everything, so nothing is real. But right. it's my my willingness and my ability to grow are, are contingent upon my... My my ability to grow is contingent upon my willingness to listen to other people yes. and learn new things. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I think that's what I want to say. Well, and it really <laughs> applies to what's going on culturally right now in the United States. It really, really does, man. I think I was always kind of an... I don't even want to say open-minded because what people are asking for right now isn't a fucking stretch. It's not like you have to open your mind to treat other people like human beings. Mm -hmm. But I've always been open to those things. I can't think of a better term for it. And I think going through recovery even more so made me look at my own shit. You know what I'm saying? And we have to own, a lot of us have to own our own shit. Everybody has to own their own shit, but we necessarily more so have to own our own shit. And so for me, looking at... As alcoholics. As alcoholics and as fucking... As two white presenting dudes in the United States, you know? I need to own... Socially, I need to own my shit. And for my greater well-being, for me personally, emotionally, mentally, I need to own my own shit. And and going through a program helped me out with that a lot. Helped me reconcile with a lot of that, you know? Not just, you know, my race or ethnicity or what I present as my race or ethnicity, you know? But just... In general, yes, my alcoholism, absolutely, I had to own it. I had to own it. You know, I did this. This is what I did. These were my actions. Am I helpless? No, I'm not helpless, you know, in some ways. Am I powerless? Absolutely powerless. But am I helpless? No. Like, I can be Mm -hmm. in charge of my shit. I didn't, I never thought that helpless and powerless were interchangeable in this circumstance here. You know, that always rung really false with me when people are like, you're not powerless, you quit drinking. And I'm like, that. you don't get it. You, I have. To, I'll explain it to you, but then that is a, 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 a hill you have to overcome, or something you have to surmount to be able <laughs> mm-hmm. to get it. To be in my shoes once again, to be able to relate to me, just like I have to relate to you, you know. And so, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, man. It's it. It occurs to me like when you talk about powerless versus versus helpless. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not helpless. I am powerless over alcohol. Right. That. That sentence, so the way that I interpret it and the way that it impli- implies to it applies to me is that if I drink, I don't have power anymore. Right. Right. Exactly. If I drink, if I have, if I have a beer, if I have a glass of wine, if I, if I drink a shot of whiskey, um, then I am powerless from that point on. Right. But I'm not helpless to continue to look for a better way and to safeguard myself against taking that first drink right and i was talking to somebody last night and we were talking about just the and this is this is my friend nabil who you know you know yeah he doesn't drink either but he's not he hasn't gone through any program he just had some health scares and he was like this is fucking i'm done with this i'm over it right and um he was we were talking about drinking and how just how gross it is now to both of us and i remembered i remembered a particular trip i think i was living in seattle and i was visiting you and eugene and so it was like 2004 or 5 and i came down and i think we were rolling around like with joe and matt maddie and you know coda and these guys and there was a lot of like cruising around i don't know if there was no event but we were just fucking like drinking all the time and i was sitting at the indigo district with you Uh and coda and matt and i remember shaking so hard and thinking if i just get this shot of whiskey down i'll be fine yeah but i literally couldn't even pick i could barely hold like I didn't have any strength in my hand to hold the shot, mm-hmm. and it was like that scene in Barfly where the guy ties That's a scarf exactly around his wrist, of. yeah, and uses it like a and lever. He pulls yeah. it around his mm-hmm. neck and he pulls it like a lever. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have a scarf at the time, but I remember getting really super close and like trying to get as close as I could because that was the that I thought that was going to be the thing that was going to help me and fix me. Mm-hmm. And it's like so fucking not, you know it. it, it it, and I don't know where I was going with this other than to how say how gross it was, um, you know, how gross it was, but also that I was powerless. I had no, there was in my mind, there was no other way that I was going to get through the rest of that yeah. day mm-hmm. unless I had a drink. And what I have found is that I'm able to ask for help now. I'm able to see my, I have fewer blind spots. I have fewer, you know, blank spots. And so. I can ask for help. I can seek help. I can help myself. You know, we we know we know our triggers better. You were talking about feeling triggered by that. 
I mean, I don't know if you were to the point of like thinking, gosh, I can't wait to pour some flesh. No, I was whiskey. only triggered in the but, sense that I was just like, I for a second I could like taste it in my I don't know, just imagined it, but not in the sense that I was like, yeah, I need to get me some mm-hmm. those brokers. I need to get me a bottle of brokers oh. and some <laughs> shitty fucking ginger ale stat, Megan. You know, no, I just had that moment where I was like, I remember that. Uh-huh. I remember that mm-hmm. drink. Like watching me drink it, I was like, the I, flavor. Re- I remember that one drink in particular. I remember it. But it's also when I see wow. myself smoking cigarettes, I'm like, oh, I remember that cigarette, you know. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So can I ask you, like, if there's any, like, are there any people or or is there any in particular that you have listened to that have helped you? Um, whether it be people, you know, or people you don't know, or, you know, people, books, things like that. Oh yeah. My dad <clears> helped <throat> me out a lot in the beginning. And my mm-hmm. first, my only first and only sponsor helped me out quite a bit with empathy. I had a really, sorry. I had a really uh, difficult time with empathy in the beginning. I was very, very self-centered as I think a lot of people are when they first hit early recovery. And so, uh, yeah, my first sponsor taught me my first and only sponsor taught me a lot about empathy. Um, as far as listening to podcast, I just I listened to a lot of speaker meeting podcasts, and it was a lot of your regular mm-hmm. dudes doing like AA speaker meetings. But I, I would always look for like the more well known guys because I wanted to hear familiar voices, and then kind of branched out from there. But there were some dudes. You know what, man? I gotta be honest, man. I fucking love fucking Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo's <laughs> speaker say. meetings were dope as fuck. And Anthony Hopkins. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think I'm outing mm-hmm. these people. I mean, they're pretty out about it already <clears throat> socially, mm-hmm. you know, at least in social media and shit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the uh, Jack G, listening to his stuff was really helpful. Um, Jack G, is that the um, punk rock guy? Yeah, from, that... from TSOL, yeah. Yeah, he he had he said some pretty cool shit. Even reading Mike Doty's Book of Drugs... I read it once drunk and then yeah. read it once sober. And just to, to, to read his, you know, account of it, Mishka, you know, reading Mishka's book about mm-hmm. running, even though that wasn't, that was just like really recently, but just really opened my eyes as far as like, not only not drinking, but changing who you are fundamentally as a person and what you do fundamentally without the use of any program. But then again, we were talking once again, before we started recording about disciplines and how he it's more of a discipline to him at this point which is great you know um mm-hmm. but yeah there were the, i mean i tried to take in all the literature i could in the beginning i tried to take it all in because i needed anything i could get other dudes at the meetings getting up and sharing women at the meetings get up and sharing he gave me some very valuable perspective on 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 not not only another human beings alcoholism but an, a woman's alcohol uh, you know what i mean like the the the, the female part of alcoholism. I don't know if I'm phrasing mm-hmm. that correctly, but just because that's not my scope, that's not how I look at things, you know. It's a different perspective. Different perspective, yeah. yeah. And I'm trying to think of the, the right way of saying it without sounding like an asshole. You know, like a woman's um, perspective on it, which I don't think is mm-hmm. asshole for me to say. If it is, I'm sorry. I'm not no. trying to be offensive. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> cherry, dude. I'm no. just trying to figure it yeah. out day by day, day by day. Yeah, I don't think, and I I wonder when you when you first told your dad, right? Who's got like almost thirty years or thirty years by now? Yeah, he's, um, you were like, yeah. I'm I'm quitting drinking. Was he was he like overjoyed? Was he skept? Not I don't want to, I don't think he was skeptical, but like, what was his was his reaction? The first time it was let's just get down to business. Because my dad is uh, really, really into sponsor sponsoring people. He's got like you know a little handful mm-hmm. of sponsees and shit. So he just, I think, just wanted to get down to business. Okay, here's what you got to do. Here's what's going to help you. Here's what worked for me. Not what you have to do, Jerry. Here's what worked for me. This is what I did. I'd recommend doing these things. I recommend finding these resources. You know, and then I think. I honestly think he hung up the phone and looked at my mom and said, well, finally got the call. It's about fucking time, you know, like because they knew where (laughs) I was at. Everybody knew where I was at. I didn't realize how bad I was until I realized how bad I was. Do you know what I mean? So they all knew Mm -hmm. how bad it was. I just didn't know. I was the last one to get the fucking news. So they were. I like that. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I just like the fact that he's very, you know, down to business. And in my mind... In my mind, I'm imagining, 
okay, well, let's get down to business before you change your mind and have another drink. Find someone who has what you <laughs> right. want. You know, that was like one of the first things he said, you know. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it was very down to, because honestly, him having so much experience with other alcoholics who are in recovery was like, well, I don't know if Jerry's going to follow through with this, so we're not going to fucking get him a cake and pop out the streamers yet because I could be calling him right now being like, I think I'm going to quit drinking and then two weeks later be like, just fucked up again. You know what I'm saying? And I had never ever right. called them to tell them I was quitting. I never told anybody I was quitting. I told myself I was quitting a few times and maybe might have told my wife I was quitting you know, when it got bad and I got real desperate and real scared and hurt somebody really bad or hurt feelings really bad. And I would tell myself a lot, like, you're fucking done. Did you ever watch that um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yeah. yeah. With Brad Pitt yeah. and Leonardo. Remember the scene where DiCaprio yeah, yeah. can't nail the line because he's fucking drunk? And he goes in the mirror and yes. he says, you fucking piece of shit. If you don't stop drinking, I'll fucking kill you. Like, I've literally had that conversation with myself drunk. So, yeah, I had told myself yeah. a lot. You need to quit or I'm going to fucking kill you, you know, but oh man, I never called anybody and was like, I think now's the time, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. Definitely where mm-hmm. they weren't going to be celebrating. I don't, I mean, now they're proud of me. I don't think, sure. I don't think I get a sure, cake sure. now either, but you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you did it. Yeah. The cake, the cake window, I feel like cake window's gone, man. It's past, Shit. right? Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe the cake window comes back every, I don't know, ten years or something. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it comes back every year. I don't know. Some people take a cake, but it's every not really. Year. I mean, I was never in a meeting where we gave a cake, though. I think I got one mm-hmm. cake, one a year, and that was it. You know, after, but I'm also real low key, man. I hang out, I hide out, and then once a year, I get up. <laughs> in july and get my chip and then go sit back down again so yeah what about this july i don't There's know no... i think i might just order myself one and then maybe have megan give it to me i don't know i really right. want a chip though i like having them yeah i mean i'll go and drill a hole in the one i have and maybe order myself one i don't know i don't know mm-hmm. how that works out because there's no physical meetings meetings yet. i doubt there'll be any in july i mean oregon might be having them at that point but i'm not gonna go you know, unless mm-hmm. the numbers are way down. If if by some grace of fucking bear that we hit New Zealand numbers, you know, by July, then yeah, I'll be at the meeting. Like, yo, where's my cake? You guys forgot about me. And they'll be like, who are you again? But um, yeah, I don't know. What are you going to do in July? You going to get, maybe I'll bake my, maybe we should bake each other cakes, mail them. Sure. Eat, you want an ice cream cake? Know, I get you a Snickers, Snickers cake. Snickers cake. So I get it. It's just a, it's all melted. It's just a box full of <laughs> rants and Snickers. That'd be dope. That'd be hilarious. Um, I don't know, man, because I was so I haven't really, I haven't been involved in the recovery community since all this shit went down in March. Yeah, and it feels I feel okay. I don't feel, but I don't feel I I, I miss it. Yeah, me you know? too. There's definitely like I miss it, and it's not really the same. And the guy who always gave me the chip before, I mean, I might reach out to him. I might say, hey, can you mail it to me? Mm-hmm. I'll may- and I'll mail you the other one because I have his phone number. Oh, because you trade out. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a trade out kind of guy. I don't, like, keep them all. <clears throat> so I figure, like, that my mojo for the last year can move on to somebody else. Actually, I never thought about That's it my that thing, way. you know? Yeah. But, um, so I might do that. Um, but I, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm not really excited to go into a room full of people. Not not because well, I don't want to. I don't want to spread it, and I don't want to. I don't want to get it. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm already exposing myself by going to work, right? Listening to people already. People are already complaining about things, and uh, it's just I. I don't feel like. I don't know. Restaurants are restaurants. I don't think they're going to change much. I mean, those that survive. Right. The only but. change in that you'll have a lot of limited seating for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're yeah. going to have to learn how to live so. off of a quarter of the amount of money they were making before. Jesus. You know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah it's, it's got to scale it down. A year old pizza oven place is going to have to open up a food truck. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that well, joke is going to hit. That took a minute. <laughs> Just because they had to scale down. So I ain't explaining it. No, it don't. But it's true, man. Like it's there's <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like the level of and this is off topic, but that one that restaurants and going out to eat 
has become so ubiquitous and people expect so much for so little yeah. that it's not a luxury or a treat or um, even something special anymore. It's just give me my stuff and why isn't it here? Yeah. And I can't believe you don't have a table for me and I can't believe my food is not here yet. Right. And uh, excuse me, waiter, where is my food? And and I said, or how long is it going to take or something like that? And somebody would always ask me that and I always wanted to be like, or when's my food going to be ready? And I'm like, well, your food will be ready when it's on the table. You'll know when it's ready. Like, well, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say to people. Yeah. You know, and it's just the whole like, so I, you know, and that's just my own, my own, problem to deal with right oh, now but um it's legitimate and i'm exposing myself to potential sickness and i feel healthy and i keep myself as healthy as i possibly can and and i mean that's the thing that i think for me is the biggest thing i can do is like okay so eat my radishes and do my exercise and stay healthy eat your right sweet potato yeah eat my sweet potato right. so but i'm and also it's hard to listen to what's it's hard to listen to the fucking news or figure out what the hell's going on one way or the other yeah. and kind of just have to wait it out, right? But but yeah, man, I mean, as far as like recovery and stuff, it's been so, it's just been so crucial for me to go to read other things and to get those other perspectives. That's where all the epiphanies have come from. That's where all of the important changes in my life have come from, where I go, you'll be sitting in a room and somebody says something, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Normally, I don't bust my phone out, but I need to type that out. I need to remember that because I'm, I'm going to forget it in the next 25 yeah. minutes or something mm -hmm. like that. And so that's been something that I'm like, like now, at least in the past, I would have my phone out, you know, in case somebody said something and I wanted to remember it and I would have a little list of things. So th those things that somebody says in passing that maybe they heard from somebody in passing and on and on and on then become some really important part of my life. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I think that, too, going back to what you said, you read Mike Doty's uh, The Book of Drugs, which anybody who's interested in recovery, in alcoholism, it's a great book. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's his birthday today, oh. too. He turned, he turned 50. Wow. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah um glad you made it mike doty go say happy birthday to mike doty yeah um but one of the things that was a big struggle for me and still is i i wouldn't i'd say it's less of a struggle now and more of a uh you know was spirituality and a sense of god and a sense of higher power and what it means and all that kind of shit but and like getting on your knees and praying every day and and having some sort of the and, I, and now when I say, oh, I don't have a concrete sense of what God is, that seems so silly to hear now. Like, I don't, you don't get to have that, right? Right. Or I don't get to have that, and that's fine. But one of the things is he would write his prayers into a book. Like, he would have a notebook. And that was something that I took into my life, and I've been doing that for the you last three or four yeah. years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's such a great idea. It's like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where they're going to go or they're supposed to go or how I'm supposed to present them to God, Lord, you know, <laughs> you know, God, Lord, whatever. Old, so old God, I mean, Lord, God, Lord. <laughs> 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 so, so God, Lord. Um, so now it's like, I can just write him in a book. Yeah. I just say, dear Lord, dear God. Hey God. Hey you. How you doing? Hey you. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Hey you. Hey you. How's it going? Thanks for being there. I need a hand. Shit's mm -hmm. a little wild you know, right now. You know, yeah. And I just, I try to, so that's, that's something that's been really, that was really helpful in finding it in somebody else and incorporating it into my own. Right. Life. Um, so I think that that's, I, I, I don't believe that anybody gets sober by themselves. Right. Yeah, and I don't I, think I, so. I, see where I you're mean, there could from. be, yeah, but you don't mean like in regards to going into the rooms or finding a pro like that type of program. But mm -mm. It, like you said last week, or maybe it was the week before, or it was last week. You said a recovery doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, we're not floating in space. We may think we are, and some of us love to mm -hmm. think we are, me included. I love to think I'm just this lone fucking major Tom astronaut just floating around in the void. But no, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, and, and, and I agree with you 100%. It doesn't take 
just you alone. There's shit you hear, shit you pick up, even if it's on TV. I mean, you would send me that quote all the time from that fucking, what was it, book of cards or house of cards about, or maybe it was the fucking West Wing. I don't, the bald guy gets up. Oh, house of yeah, cards. he gets up and does the whole speech about alcoholism mm-hmm. and taking it one day at a time. And <clears throat> like, you know what I mean? Like you picked that up, that resonated with you. You were like, that's some cold ass shit. I want that. Like, I want, I want mm-hmm. that for me, you know? So it's not like you need to go into a church basement to get it, you know. You just got to find it. It'll find you. It'll find you. Fuck yeah. you find it. It'll find your ass. It will. So so I want to read the, the quote. Yeah, because you from, love the it. The character's name is Doug Stamper. <laughs> I do love it. And so Doug Stamper is, I think he's the campaign manager or he's like the the chief of staff or some shit. And basically he does all the shady shit for um, uh, Kevin Spacey's um, character. Right. In that. Kevin Spacey can just do his own shitty on? shit on his own time. No, not anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and it's really fucked up because there's a lot of other great actors in that yeah, show. Yeah, but I know. um, you know, like Sean Penn's But wife. so this guy and this, <clears throat> I don't even know the actor's name, and I feel bad that I that I don't. But um, <clears throat> this so he's he's a shady ass character. He does a lot of evil, dark stuff, right? But he's a, he's an alcoholic. He's in AA, and he's sitting in one of these rooms off to the side. You know, it's one of these weird ass rooms in the back of some building, right. and folding chairs and the whole thing. He says, "I'm Doug, and I'm an alcoholic. One of the things I do for a living is count. I count votes, yays, nays, neutrals, abstaining, and I'm good at it. But the most important count I do has nothing to do with work. It's the number of days since April fourth, nineteen ninety nine. As of this morning, that's five thousand one hundred and eighty five. The bigger that number gets, the more it frightens me because I know all it takes is one drink to go back to zero. Most people see fear as a weakness. It can be. Sometimes for my job, I have to put fear into other people. I know that's not right, but if I'm honest, like the fourth step asks us to, I have to be ruthless because failure is not an option. The same goes for my sobriety. I have to be ruthless with myself. I have to use my fear. It makes me stronger. Like everyone else in this room, I can't control who I am, but I can control zero. Fuck the zero. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Right. That's so forceful. And it resonated like, with me. Yeah. And it did resonate with you. And it probably still mm-hmm. resonates with you, you know? And But like you're saying, sure. like, nobody gets sober alone. That thing occurred to you in a time when you needed it to occur to you do you know what i'm saying and i know it sounds all mm-hmm. woo woo hippie fucking super spiritual like you needed that at the time you got it but you did that's why it worked you know like oh wow i needed to hear well, that i needed to know that i needed to have that thing happen you know here's the here's the other thing i needed that shit before i heard yeah, it, it just happened it just, you know i was ready yeah. well you had to open up i the was door. really ready yeah. right so, I mean, yeah, you're right. Like, it does sound woo-woo. You needed to hear that right when you yeah, heard it. Yeah, and I feel corny like, well, as fuck saying it, but it's the truth. But it's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And the truth is, I needed to hear it before. Yeah. I needed to hear it. Fuck, I needed to hear all this shit a long time ago. Right. But, and it was probably around, I just wasn't listening. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I was listening that I was able to fucking dial in some, you know, whatever the frequency is. Right. And go like, oh, okay. And I mean, Jesus Christ, if we hadn't done anything to change our lives, where would, where would you be in, a rut, fucking in the hole? Still angry, or dead. sick, or dead, mm-hmm. miserable, unable to, unable to see yourself in any other way of living. Mm-hmm. I mean, even, I don't, I don't know, you know, we've talked, you've talked about it before, but the whole... And I know the the phrase existential crisis gets thrown around a lot, these especially days, now. But, you yeah, know, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> when you talk about like what I want to do for work and how I want to make a living mm-hmm. and how I want to be perceived and how I want to, what makes me happy, you know, like w- it wasn't until some something happened that made you think, oh, I don't have to keep going this way. Mm-hmm. Before this, I thought I had to keep going this way because this is the only way that I knew. Right, and it worked for a little while. And it worked sure. for a little yeah. while. And now it's not working because life keeps advancing forward and you still keep using the same tool over and over again, you know? And that tool, as as life advances mm-hmm. and things get harder to deal with, that tool's not working, you know? It's like digging a hole, you know? You have to hit bedrock eventually and that shovel ain't gonna cut it, 
you know, you said, but you you hit caliche before you hit bedrock, you know, the hard clay shit. And like, the shovel ain't going to cut it, but you still, for me, I still kept hitting it with the shovel being like, this is going to work eventually, you know, because I got through all the soft shit with it, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I did. And then maybe you realize either you need to get a pickaxe mm-hmm. or maybe it's time to stop digging the exactly. hole. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? To... Let's get lost in this analogy. I love it. Because that's the only way I really can like express it sometimes. But you're right. It's either get a new tool or maybe just abandon the whole project entirely, which that was it for me. I was like, you know what? I'm going to abandon this project entirely and just use that other tool for something more useful. You know, There's a phrase in human psychology that I, I am at a loss for right now. Mm-hmm. But I can I can describe it a little bit. And it's basically human beings tend to feel like, especially when they've put a lot of time, energy, and effort into something, mm-hmm. that it has more value simply because of the time, energy, and effort that they've put into it. And so they are more unwilling to leave it even if it is it is losing them, you know, if it's if it's not if it's not serving them anymore. Right. So <clears throat> you would say, Oh, well, but I've put so much time into this X, right? whether it be a relationship or a job or a project. And so you go, well, it's got to be worth more than it is. And if you were to look at it objectively, you'd go, this is not working. It hasn't been working for a very long time. I should have gotten rid of this a long time ago. Right. And I think that that's, that's something that we, we do with, hell, we do it with everything, everything you know, but yeah. uh, we do it with. We do it with alcohol too, mm-hmm. like, but I mean, but alcohol's been been there for me, and then we we realize no, it hasn't. Right, it's never been there. Not real. No, no, I was gonna say not really. No, it hasn't at all. No, no, no yeah. not, at not at all. And but yeah, so it's like time to stop digging the hole because the hole is not serving any purpose anymore. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. That was a and bad like, analogy. <laughs> I just spent more along the lines of the tools, you know, using yeah. alcohol as this thing yeah, that yeah, serves yeah. you and now it no longer serves you because the problems you have are far more complex than than what you were trying mm-hmm. to solve it with earlier. Plus on top of I mean, we all know this is a recovery podcast. We know the myriad of problems that alcohol can cause you. Physically, emotionally, like it fucks your relationships up, it fucks up everything. It fucks up everything. If you're drinking the way I drank, you're fucking everything up. You know. You are. You're just fucking it all up. If you're drinking the way I drank, that should, that should be the first line. Up. Up. What's that? Yes, that's your TED talk right yeah. there. You fucking everything up. Um, yeah, man. Nobody it hang it out won't with just you. ruin your. It's not just about the relationships and the money and stuff. Like it's your health. And I, I mean, I can't tell you. Like it'll give you the gout. It'll straight it gave give me you the, the gout. gout. You weren't even forty, and you were rocking the gout. You were like in. I don't even mm-hmm. know if you were in your mid thirties, early thirties, early thirties, thirty two. I was like, "Damn, John has gout, and he's like thirty two. Like he, you have to work pretty hard to get gout, <laughs> or not work at all." That is a lot of fucking booze and, and salami. Yeah. <laughs> welcome to the welcome to my world. You know what I'm saying? Booze and salami. That uh-huh. should be the that should have been the name of your old autobiography. Booze and salami. The <laughs> John a tale of John Staley. <laughs> so. So I, 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 I can't stress it enough at how important it is for me to shut my mouth and listen to people yeah. and to read uh, what other people have to say, um, which is not to say that 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 my experience is in inval- I mean, obviously, we're sitting here, we're talking because we we're assuming that somebody else is listening. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that. Which is not to say that my voice is invalid or that it's not what I have to say is not valid. No, yeah. But I don't continue to grow by simply speaking and thinking my own thoughts. Yeah. I continue to grow by reading what somebody else has written, what's listening to what somebody else has said, and fe- trying to feel what somebody else has gone through in a way that is meaningful to me. And then I can, then I can pass that on to somebody. Yeah, else. absolutely. Yes, sir. 
sweaty I think balls. That... Yeah, I'm just agreeing with you. I don't have an amendment to that. I mean, I think honestly, I know, I know, you, I know. You listen to another no, person; I... they teach you that lesson. Maybe you learn a lesson from something else, someone else. You go express that to someone else. They're like, "No, actually, that's wrong." And then you listen mm. to how that's wrong, and then fix the way you were thinking to correct it. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. it's as fucking easy as moon pies, man. Listen. Changing, yeah, changing my mind and changing my opinions and changing my way of thinking has made me stronger and has been the best thing that I have done yeah. for myself yeah. is being being flexible. Fle- in yes, that, and that's in that. the biggest part of recovery, and that's what's going to save us. It's, flex- it's not all mm-hmm. the only thing, but that's going to be one of the tools is being able to be flexible, being able to change <clears> your mind, and opening up your fucking ears and listening. Not only is that going to... Save us as alcoholics, but as human beings, especially right now. Once mm-hmm. again, to tie it into America right now. Open your fucking ears, America. Listen. There's there's shit going on. You need to listen and learn. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nobody's fucking learning. They're all looking from their own <clears throat> tiny little perspective out of their own little peephole and being like, well, that doesn't happen to me. It doesn't matter that it's not happening to you. It's happening to someone else. You need to listen to learn it. Mm-hmm. Yo. Straight up. And that's a go. cherry thought. da dun dun <laughs> so i, 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 that, I think that's a great way pumpkins, that's a yeah. i think that's a great way to end yeah. it um me too because i'm burr, burr. i i just want to say to those of you who are our regular listeners so we're not gonna have a show for the next two weeks and i know i know i know that's that's painful to hear but um jerry and i are gonna work on getting next next season's uh, production schedule like what we're going to talk about um we're going to take a little break and work on some other things and um all that kind of stuff so that we can start again fresh on the third of july which is a it's not quite our both our birthdays but we want to like start a new season on our 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 so our birth birthdays. month what's yeah. our birthstone our birth what's our month. alcoholic birthstone what is <laughs> i don't know what is this july's is broken birthstone? broken old english bottle <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> broken old english that is the birth that is the alcoholic birthstone um broken smirnoff bottle. yeah exactly um, <laughs> so yeah so we'll just our 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 next episode will be out on july 3rd which is a friday and so that'll be kind of to commemorate our you know jerry's uh sober birthday on the fourth and my sober birthday on the sixth yeah so that's kind of the the deal with if you don't hear us that's what we'll be doing so um and as always reach out to us yeah hit us up we love to listen to you guys thanks again for listening our music as always is by neglect you can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com and you can find us on all social media platforms that matter instagram facebook and twitter and you can reach us at a is for alcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>